This Week in Radio Tech, episode 306, is brought to you by Lavo and the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. By the Omnia 7 FM and the new Omnia 7 AM audio processors, Omnia features and advanced audio shaping tools at a budget-friendly price. And by the Telos HX1 and HX2 telephone hybrids, the most advanced hybrids ever developed for use with analog phone lines. Charlie Wooten Hamcall NF4A is our go-to guy for what's happening in amateur radio. Charlie joins Chris Tobin with highlights from the Dayton Hamvention, including a new member of the D-Star family. It's broadcast engineering with a side of ham. This week in Radio Tech, episode 306. I'm your host this evening, or I should say today, it's Chris Tobin, and I'm along with our guest, Charlie Wooten. He'll be with us in a second. Just a reminder that Kirk Harnack, our host, normally at this time in front of the camera in Nashville, is traveling somewhere in the Pacific Rim. That's all I'm going to say. For the rest of you, you'll have to wait until next week. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Charlie Wooden and ask him to say just a quick bio of himself, what he's doing, where he's at, and then we'll uh, do our first sponsor and then get talking about Hamvention, Ham Convention. Uh, let's see, let's say it right. Yeah, I, I think I'll get that right. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. And I'll, uh, we'll go from there. So Charlie, if you would, step in and let's uh, get a little brief story of yourself. Okay, thank you, Chris. It's, it's everybody just calls it Dayton. Nobody calls it the Ham Venture except for the Ham Venture people. Um, right, exactly. That's why I was thinking Dayton. I just couldn't remember it. If you say Dayton, then everybody if they're, if they're in, they they know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, as uh, Chris said, my name's Charlie Wooden. I'm the director of engineering and IT for iHeart Media in Panama City, Florida. I have uh, six stations here that I look after: one AM and five FMs, and uh, been in the business since about 1969 when I built my first FM radio station, uh, and worked for worked for myself. Worked for National Public Radio. I've worked uh, in public broadcasting uh, about nine years, and then uh, after uh, I realized about the consolidation of media after the Communications Act of '96, I uh, decided I'd better get me a job uh, with one of the big ones. So I. Happened to get a chance to become uh, the uh, director of engineering for the market engineer here for Panama City for Clear Channel, which now is called iHeart. And uh, in the 90s, I did a little bit of uh, work for the U.S. State Department as a contractor in Eastern Europe. Had a good time doing that. It was then Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary, and Croatia. And uh, still go back to Croatia uh, to this day. In fact, I was there in March because I have a lot of friends that I met when I was over there in 1995, but uh, that's about it, Chris. Go ahead. Excellent. All right. Oh, nice world traveler. I like that. Well, uh, everyone, this is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 306. As you know, we talk about technologies relating to radio, television, internet broadcasting, and many other things. And things that impact your life in ways that you probably didn't realize they did, and we sometimes remind you of that. So this episode, we're going to talk about a few things from Dayton and how technology in that part of the, uh, that part of the hobbyist realm actually can be used uh, and applied here in broadcasting. But before we do that, I must remind everyone, in order for these shows to happen, we do have sponsors. And this particular sponsor for the opening of the show Show is Omnia 7 FM from the Telos Alliance. And you know, up to now, there have been two choices when it comes to audio processing. All the features and advanced audio shaping tools with, of course, a five-figure price tag, if you'd like, or gear that fits in your budget. But what, what <clears throat> made you compromise on performance capabilities was price, uh, size of the box, or, or the, the manufacturer, whatever it was. That's changed. No more compromises. Meet Omnia 7 FM, the premium, feature-rich FM audio processor that's surprisingly affordable. I won't get into pricing. That you have to talk with your dealer about. But trust me, it'll be good. But low price doesn't mean low performance. As we all know, Omnia 7 FM delivers the powerful, clear, precise Omnia Signature Sound. That's the first choice of top stations worldwide. Now, let's remember, we've talked about signature sounds in the past. Everybody has a signature sound, just as anyone in marketing or branding will tell you. In order to be recognized in your marketplace, you have to have a sound or an appearance or, or both. So in the case of radio, it's about the sound. It's what the ears hear and how it develops in someone's brain and someone's mind. And when they hear their favorite music or talk or sports or news, it's all about the signature sound. And Omnia 7 FM can give you that and control. And that's what you want to be competitive and number one in your market. 
Now, it comes with a, 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 you know, standard features, and, and sometimes people overlook them. One thing is it's selectable FM or HD and streaming. I said it, that's right, FM, HD, and streaming features. That's very handy. Undo, exclusive Omnia technology that now removes distortion and mathematically recreates the peaks sliced from today's poorly mastered contemporary music. Can't speak for those who master songs, but some of your favorite hits do have some peaks that are a little bit squashed or, or chopped off the top. The Omnia technology that removes distortion and mathematically recreates the peaks is available in the Omnia 7 FM. Undo restores life, brilliance, and dynamic range, and for any type of music. And probably if you have some of those talk programs that tend to be a little, uh, how would you say, too squashed, that might help there too. But all these can be done with the Omnia 7 as we continue on. Uh, oops. Talking about Toolbox's sophisticated Omnia sound shaping technology, it gives you the power to analyze and refine your signature sound that we spoke of earlier. That's right. Everything about the way your station sounds can be tailored and custom and organized in such a way that the Omnia 7 FM will give you the competitive edge. Just keep that in mind. Onboard are tools ranging from loudness metering to real-time analyzers to oscilloscopes and more. Simultaneous HD internet streaming, encoding, and RDS options are available, putting Omnia 7 FM head and shoulders above any other comparably priced audio processor in features, performance, and value. Visit telosalliance.com, click on Omnia, and you'll find out more. And just ask around. Call up your dealer. Ask him about the features and what he can expect and get the pricing you, you know you should have. You won't be disappointed. Omnia 7 FM. It's the way to create the sound in the market, the branding and marketing that people always enjoy to say, you sound better. You sound in this way that I can't explain it, but I like it. And it makes me remember you. Remember, branding and marketing is not only a physical trait, but something can be done audibly. Omnia 7 FM, and go to the website, telosalliance.com, and click on Omnia. So, we go from our sponsor to our guest. Dayton was your, was your uh, topic, is the topic that we're going to have. Charlie, what was, first things first, what was the, uh, you get to Dayton, what were you looking for in particular? Anything or just open-minded, walk around, let's see what we have. Well, let me say this. I have an Omnia 7, by the way. I wanted to say that. <laughs> okay, well, let's I... talk about that. Let's talk about the Omnia 7 you have. Does it create the yeah. sound, the signature you're looking for? Yeah. What was the I'll, reason I'll, you chose that over very, the other models? Yeah. Yeah, it was very easy to install. Uh, uh, I, it's, on, it's on one of our, it's actually on a translator. And uh, we have flat land down here and 250 watts at 300 feet does quite quite a good, uh, has quite a good coverage. And uh we're very happy with it. We'll let it go at that. But I just wanted to piggyback on your uh, commercial there. I'm sure Kirk doesn't mind that at all. Well, no, that's, that's good because if I was looking for something, I do this quite often. If I'm looking for a product or a service, I usually will ask my dealer or representative of the product, hey, do you have a user list? Who can I talk to to find out how they like it or not? Is your customer service where it should be? So you've done exactly what I normally would have done. I would have called around and asked, hey, you guys in Omnia? Yeah, okay, what do you think? Oh, good. Service? Oh, good. So perfect. Thank you for the testimonial. That'll be just fine for after the, the spot. <laughs> so, Dayton it is. Okay, Dayton. Uh, I'm... I'm a pretty active ham. Uh, I've been a ham since 1962 when I was 12 years old. Uh, but uh, my, my thing in ham radio, there's so many different facets of ham radio. You have, you know, just uh, rag chewing, you have traffic handling, you have uh, contesting, you have DXing, you have television, you have digital. There's so many things that you can do with it. But um, my thing is DXing and contesting. That's what, what I do. I, that's 99% of my ham radio activity is. Uh, dealing with uh, uh, working DX and, uh, and uh, contesting. So every, the, the highlight for me personally every year is uh, going to, for Dayton is to check in at the Crown Plaza Hotel downtown, which is over 10 miles away from the Hera Arena, by the way. And uh, seeing all my contesting and DXing friends, we basically take over that whole hotel for uh, uh, starting on Wednesday, uh, usually, and uh, all the way through uh, Sunday morning. Uh, so, so, uh, that, that's, we have a lot of activities there at the hotel. There's a big, uh, uh, hospitality suite, uh, for all the contesters, different contest clubs around the country, get, get, get together and, uh, uh, uh rent the rooms. We have bar, we have a bar in there, ca a cash bar and, and, uh, every night, uh, about 11 o'clock, uh, various organizations, uh, sponsor, uh, uh, pizza and they will bring in literally 
50 boxes of pizza and stack them up and people will, we've got, it's in a big uh, kind of a small ballroom and um, sit around and uh, have a cold beer and, and tell lies about uh, the latest DX we worked or whatever. But uh, again, that's, that's just the one facet of, uh, of ham radio that I'm really, in, I really enjoy. I do go, obviously I do go over to the ham fest uh, and uh, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of fun. I like to go to the boneyard. That's where I really, uh, uh, really like to uh, spend my time is out in this area that's about the size of uh, about the size of three football fields. If you can imagine an outdoor uh, electronic garage sale, and it's more than just ham radio. There is test equipment. I saw a Pacific Recorders radio mixer in very good condition uh, for sale at uh, at out there in the boneyard. All kinds of broadcast equipment. You'd be surprised what you'd see out there, and you wonder exactly how it might have got there. And not going to ask any questions, but if the price is right, you know, whatever. Um, uh, and there's a lot of new equipment uh, coming out. This year was a banner year for that, and I kind of made me a list here of some of the things, some of the new products. And uh, Chris, if you need to take a break here for another of your um, uh, commercials, just let me know and we can, we can break in. I'm, I'm listening to you so I can hear you when you, when you come back. But uh, I wanted to go over some of the things that were really um, uh, the new, new products and digital is a big thing. Now digital is a very big thing in ham radio on, on VHF and UHF. But, but uh, there were some, uh, several regular HF type uh, uh, transceivers. I guess the big, the big uh, news at this uh, at this particular uh, uh, Dayton was the ICOM seventy three hundred, and it's a new new transceiver, has fifteen discrete uh, bandpass filters in it, which is uh, you know something uh, with the DSP technology, um, has a real time spectrum scope and uh, uh, with the resolution from five to uh, five to one thousand kilohertz wide. Which is which is enough, by the way, for you broadcasters for, for ham radio. That's that's more than enough. Uh, can also uh, look at audio waveforms on it. So if you're trying to, uh, you know, look at distortion or whatever, or, or look for something particular in the audio, you can see it there, clipping or whatever. Um, they, in fact, they there were so many people buying seven, uh, ICOM seventy three hundreds at Dayton that most of the dealers ran out of them. Uh, that they were replenished, of course, shortly after Dayton, but they only brought so many with them, and uh, they sold every one of them. But uh, it's a great, a great radio. Runs 100 watts, uh, 160 through six meter all mode, and uh, it has a general coverage receiver in it that covers from 30 kilohertz all the way to 74.8 megahertz. And you may say, why in the hell would they go to 74.8 megahertz? Well, there is a European or other, well, I shouldn't say European because it's in other other areas of the world too. There's another ham band which we don't have here in uh, Region Two of the uh, I, of of the uh, international uh, zones. Uh, it's called four meters, which is up around 70 megahertz, and uh, so that's why the receiver, I guess, is designed to go to 74.8 megahertz. Um, and uh, so, anyhow, that's that's uh, one of the hot tickets at uh, at Dayton this year as far as new technology is concerned. Uh, Ellacraft, who has a lot of uh, great radios, or several, a lot, a lot of people using their great radios, uh, came out with a new uh, model called a KX2. And it's this is thing you literally put in your pocket. It's uh, 5.8 inches by 2.8 inches by 1.5 inches, and it weighs 13 ounces. It's got a built-in a built in battery pack, and uh it's a, it puts out 10 watts, and it's all modes. It's it's a sideband, CW, whatever. And uh, typically, your mar your mileage may vary based on your transmit duty cycle, but uh, typically eight hours on the battery pack. So this this is a great little transceiver for just sticking your pocket and uh, taking with you on a trip. It's it's amazing technology. Uh, the one of the big news, one of the big digital news things at uh, at Dayton was uh, the fact that. Uh, Kenwood is going to get in the D-Star business, and for those who aren't hams, D-Star is a digital transmission system that has become uh, one of the standards being used by hams all over the world. It's a, it's a digital system that was developed by the Japan Amateur Radio League and has been available on ICOM radios. It's open source, so it's not, uh, it's not proprietary or owned by it's, it's anybody can use it. And uh, Kenwood 
has decided to jump on board with D-Star, and they'll be coming out with the radio and listen to all these features because it's amazing. I'm going to I'm gonna have to read these because you won't believe what this thing will do. It do analog. APRS has a built-in GPS, Bluetooth, SD, SD card slot, uh, TFT display, and uh, this thing will operate uh, on uh, 144, 220, and... Uh, 450, 440 megahertz. It's a tri-band radio, five watts, and uh, it's uh, going to be uh, very interesting to to see uh, this new manufacturer get into the D-Star or jump on the on the on the uh, D-Star bandwagon. Uh, only ICOM has been in that in in the D-Star area. Yezu is has a system they call Fusion, and these two systems are not are not compatible at all, and. Um, so, so it's uh, it's uh, there's kind of a, a fight going on, if you will, or a little tussle going on between the manufacturers, and it looks like uh, uh, ICOM and uh, Kenwood are going to be on the D Star side of the fence, and uh, and Yezu is going to be on the Fusion side of the fence. But then there's this other company called uh, Wireless Holdings. It's a fairly new company. And they're coming out that with a radio or several sets of radios and accessories that will do any of those things, any of the modes. It'll do, uh, it'll do the D Star. It'll do Fusion, DMR. Uh, some people call it Apco 25 or P25 uh, digital. Uh, it, it, they're having, uh, they're, they're having, uh, they're having three. They're having it coming out with three models. One is a, a full radio that puts out 20 watts with all these modes in it. Uh, it'll be a tri-band radio, and uh, then they they come out with with something where you can sit, put it in your home, hook it to a computer, and uh, be on the air, so to speak, through uh, the, the digital repeaters around the world over the internet. So and so it's it's an interesting thing, and then they have uh, uh, kind of a dongle device called a DV Mini, which uh, you hook to a, like a Raspberry Pi, and uh, you take your your handheld like a Here's here's a uh, uh, an ICOM uh, ID fifty ID fifty one here that I have uh, that you, you would use this to to uh, to transmit to this dongle and the dongle would put it over the internet and get you into a repeater system. Uh, to give you an example, uh, Ray Novak uh, NIJA who works for ICOM and I were in Mozambique in two thousand thirteen on a de expedition with a group of guys. Uh, we were, do, were putting putting a Mozambique on the air. And uh, he had one of these uh, dongles hooked up to uh, to the internet. We had wireless internet there uh, where we were located, luckily. And um, and he was able to take his uh, two, uh, 440 HT handy talkie and talk to people back in the States. And he could walk around the compound where we were, where the, where the expedition was going on. He was transmitting to his little dongle and putting this into the internet and going and talking to people. It really, we said it in the United States, but it could really be anywhere in the world. So it's, it's, uh, it's a good, uh, it's a new thing where you combine the technology of ham radio and the internet and, and you get the best, best of both worlds because you can be, be here using five Watts on a walkie talkie inside of a building and you on, on 440 megahertz. And you can talk to someone literally in Japan or, Russia or Germany or wherever. Uh, and it's, it's really it's really cool technology. Um, a couple of other short new technologies before we I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Uh, Yezu introduced a new FT891 mobile uh, radio. It's a really small radio, but it's got a nice display on it. It has a detachable uh, uh, detachable control head, so you don't have to. To mount the whole radio together, you can you can pop off the uh, control head, mount it, say on the dashboard of your car, and then have a small cable that goes uh, to the radio up under the seat, and it uses 32-bit IFDSP in it. And then Flex Radio, the last thing I was going to talk about, had a uh, uh, kind of an improved uh, to give to give you Flex Radio makes these computer control radios, and you use your mouse and your keyboard, and your monitor. To, to operate your radio. Well, they've come out with this new system called Maestro where you actually have a control head that's connected to the radio. It gives you that tactile feel of turning a knob, 
seeing a dial moving up and down the ba- uh, up and down the, the screen, uh, pushing a button rather than clicking on something or or hitting Alt C to do something or whatever. So it it, it made it a more conventional, uh, you know, more conventional radio, but using the new. Uh, the new computer technology with uh, uh, software-defined radios, and that's that's a new that's a new uh, uh, thing is is the software-defined radios. They were all over date, and there were hell. I guess there were probably eight or ten different models of SDRs that you could find uh, it, it, at different booths in Dayton. And I'll turn it back over there to you, Chris, for <laughs> any questions or comments. Well, that was excellent information, and I have to say that the theme behind everything you talked about is internet protocol and communicating via IP. And I will say, I have my uh, my Kenwood analog radio. This is the the old fashioned approach of things, little uh, TH six F, very handy little guy. Or if you want, you can do the the Baofeng as uh, as I am an amateur operator as well. And one of the reasons I've enjoyed amateur radio is because the innovation, not innovation, the uh, the thinking and and the playing around, the tinkering that I like to do and testing, and it, it helps me to understand understand a lot of things and not get uh, skewered and lose my job because of the testing and experimenting that I've done. And it's funny how you talk about the, the D-Star Fusion and XDN and what's uh, Moto, Turbo, Moto Turbo, I think is another one that people use. All IP-paced <clears throat> uh, protocol uh, tech, uh, communications. And it's interesting because in broadcasting these days, many of us who are broadcast engineers, both from radio, television, uh, or amateur operators, uh, will now begin using IP on a, on a regular daily basis, whereas you know, 20 years ago that wasn't even thought of as on the periphery. Now it's both in our hobby as well as in our uh, professional life. And it's pretty interesting to see how even in the hobby world of, of the various communications uh, manufacturers, even they don't have interoperability exactly down to a science. Um, so it's funny to, you know, to listen to what you said, what you discovered at Dayton, and then we think about we got you know, Wheatnet, Livewire, Ravenna, uh, Dante, and all these wonderful protocols that do a lot of things over the uh, Internet Protocol concept. But yet, in order for them all to talk together, we have to find another piece of glue to bring it together. So it's, it's good to know that the IP world is what it is, and we can at least learn on our own speed and then also work in our professional lives and, and, and have fun with it. In your time as an amateur... Uh, operator, how much experimenting or uh, you know tinkering have you done in with between RF and IP or just RF and just keeping the, the inquisitive part of it? Because I will say this, in my fun part of doing what I do, both in my professional life and the hobby, I enjoy dealing with RF and trying to make things work with linking and, and connecting stuff through the wireless concept and finding ways to do it in such a not typical manner. You know, it's like, well, you've connected something at five gig or 10 gigahertz between two endpoints, but the distance is 20 miles. And how did you do that? It's like, well, it took a little finessing, but we made it work and understood more about the modulation schemes. And now with digital, it's even more, uh, it, uh, more of a challenge. And I say this because I just recently got an email blast from the folks at Fraunhofer who are doing testing in the E-band range. Uh, have you heard of E-band? No, what, what, what is that, 70 gigs or something? You are correct. It's about uh, 71 gigahertz, 71 to 76. And they've just done the first, I think was it 6 gigabit or 10 gigabit link across 20 kilometers distance between two endpoints. It was a pretty wild press release. I'm reading this going, holy moly. And, you know, what can you do with this and how could it be applied? And the, and the concept is this is for also short ter- uh, short haul satellite communications purposes they're looking to uh, use this in. So I'm thinking, wow, you know, the way we're moving with wireless ISPs and wireless interconnect, even for our business uh, locations, 71 gigahertz linking, not saying that you're going to get, you know, 60, 70 miles out of it, but the bandwidth on it is equivalent to your, you know, 10 gigabits in your office, but it's a wireless form. I mean, that, that's just the thought of it alone is like, wow. But because of the hobby, those of us who have the, the fun of playing with RF and toying with it, when this technology comes to the commercial market, we already are familiar with how to handle propagation at, say, 70 gigahertz and how to deal with Fresnel zones and go, oh, yeah, well, we can't just put that little dish there because of X. Whereas others who aren't in the hobby, who aren't the do-it-yourselfers, sort of have to rely on, hopefully, the right information from the manufacturer. Have you found that that kind of work in, the, in being an amateur has helped you in, in a, your professional life? Just curious. Oh, yeah. Especially exactly what you described. Uh, especially, and I, I haven't done, I've done some television work, but it's been, I was in television in the early 70s. When I first got out of college, I worked at a, 
well, I, actually before college, in high school, I worked at a commercial TV station, uh, running camera, and then I directed the 6 and 10 o'clock news, and then I uh, always wanted to get into uh, the engineering part of it, and went away to college and graduated and came back and became a transmitter supervisor and uh, uh, had to work on some water-cooled GE uh, high-band TV transmitters for a couple of years. But but I, the, the STL thing is, I mean, just 900 megahertz, you know, 950 megahertz for the Part uh, part 74 stuff. I mean, uh, I've, I've put in a lot of those over the years, and uh, in my ham radio experience is right there, right there in the middle of it. I mean, uh, right down to putting the connectors on and, you know, on the cable and all of, all of those things. Uh, uh, but, you know, on the other hand, uh, uh, building, you know, talk about tinkering. Uh, I, 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 at one point in time, uh, built a couple of high power amplifiers and, uh, for, for, for ham radio. I had a, back when I was working for myself in the, in the late eighties and into the nineties, I had a, uh, I had a kilowatt mobile, and uh, I built from a Motorola Applications Note uh, a uh, a kit. Uh, well, not a kit, but that all I had the information was from the app- Applications Note that Motorola semiconductors used to put out. I'm sure, some of you remember those from years ago uh, from 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 the uh, semiconductor division out of Phoenix, Arizona. They they uh, had a uh, mobile amplifier running off of 12 volts. Uh, would put out a kilowatt. It had eight MRF four fifty four transistors in it, and uh, and then they were on pallets, uh, four pallets, uh, two transistors to a pallet. You had a four way uh, splitter at the input and a four way combiner at the output, and uh, and I used that thing mobile and uh, and and that that was my main tinkering was with uh, with RF. I I, I really. Uh, Really enjoy uh, working with high power RF, and uh, and uh, I think that's what's uh, kept me kept me sane over the years. Is I, I really enjoy um, you know working on installing a new transmitter and uh, maintaining that transmitter and maintaining my amateur station uh, uh, so that it's operating uh, at the at the, the best efficiency. And uh, I've I've spent a lot of money uh, on the hobby. I have a, a ICOM seventy eight hundred transceiver. Which I was able to to pick up for a bargain. That transceiver, just to give you an idea, that transceiver cost about ten thousand dollars new. Now I didn't pay ten thousand dollars for it, but it's the, I, and and I have an alpha amplifier, which is one of the top of the line amplifiers. Uh, but it it's uh, it's an expensive hobby, but but it but at the same time, uh, you know, it, it gives you a chance to 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 uh, realize and an experiment with propagation. Uh, there's a lot of things that go over propagation that are really strange. Uh, you'll swear that a particular band is dead, and uh, and you'll you'll um, maybe talk. I've got a friend in, in near Chicago, uh, K9 PG uh, Paul Gentry, and uh, we have uh, we have uh, we have talked during contest. We'll we'll tell I'll tell him we're on a frequency where we can hear each other. To go to ten meters. Uh, no, 10 meters is dead. No, let's try 10 meters. And we go to 10 meters and damn, there they, the, the signal's there. It may not be strong, but it's there. So we're able to make another contact, another valley contact in a contest on another band. Uh, all kinds of things like that. Uh, but uh, RF is my big tinkering thing. I would agree. Uh, my, mine, mine, it's the same for me. I, you know, our last podcast, is the last one we did or the one before that? No, two back. I did a did the show, my part of the show from a, uh, a park bench outside, and I uh, used a Wi-Fi a Ubiquity link to make it happen. But I used the Wi-Fi adapter in the laptop, so the Ubiquity link was my, I will say, shaped RF right. uh, director. And I was trying to explain during the the show that you know one of the reasons I enjoy doing these things is because I understand the principles. And, and let's face it, RF is a Black magic, no matter how you think about it, it defies sometimes what we believe to be the physical realm that we operate in. <laughs> and you know, you, you work, you do your best to understand the math and say, okay, based on the math, this beam width, the 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 the, the pattern by which the RF should be focused is 13 degrees left to right. But there's, we all know, 
there's more to it than just that. But you try to work within these confines. And I did the, the entire show from out in the park, about a city block from where I, where I was, where the, uh, the actual internet connection was. And it worked very well. And reading up on the E-band and, and uh, the 71 gig, actually, I think the E-band is technically 60 gigs to 90 gigs. And I discovered that this particular radio spectrum is now going to be, is now being looked at and probably already tested for 5G. Okay, the 5G wireless technologies or the Internet of Things that come. So, you know, those of us who have the fun of working with RF and, and looking to do things and maybe want to advance our, our careers, the 5G stuff that's coming out, because as you know, cellular data or mobile smartphone data is increasing exponentially every month. So who knows in two years how many people, billions of people will be doing data by their smartphone and nothing else. These backhaul circuits, right? The, the connections between cell sites or data points that your, your smartphone connects to now need pipes that are so large that you would never thought of it before because the fiber in a building is where you get the large pipe. Now out in the wireless world, how do you do it between cell sites? Maybe this E-band. So it's fun to read and, and understand and see what they're learning and discovering in propagation as well. So, uh, But yeah, I, I, I've done a lot of RF stuff where I've defied the rules for some. I, I put up a... Uh, a, a repeater site uh, about nine, uh, ten years ago now, I think of it, eh, maybe 12. And I just used basic principles. They said, look, we have a spot on the tower we can go. Uh, the local tower management company is more than happy to let us use the site. Uh, the cost is we just pay the electric bill, which, as we all know, if you do it right, it's very minimal. And you can easily afford, the club can afford it. So we put up an antenna, standard collinear uh, vertical antenna on the tower, about 275 feet on this tower. Ground elevation, eh, roughly 50 feet. And everyone looked at me like, wow, you're, you we're putting in a, a small antenna. It was a seven foot in the day. This was a cell wave PD-201 is the model. And they said, wow, it's, it's, it, you know, we should use a super station mass of 22 foot and do this, this and that. I said, well, that's all well and good, but what are we trying to cover? Where are we trying to hear and talk to? And I said, the higher gain antenna tends to put that signal, I'll use my hand, up and over where you're trying to be because that's what a you know 22 foot station master will do. I said for what we're like trying to accomplish, we should probably go lower to the horizon, you know, lower to where we are. They all laughed at me. Twelve years later, that antenna repeater system is still functioning, and I can talk into the site for those who need geogra geographical locations. It's a site uh, uh, in Nassau County, Long Island. It's on the South Shore. It's a small tower setup, or actually, yeah, it's it's a small communications tower. I can talk into it on a portable, four watt portable, from Midtown Manhattan into this site, which is over 25, maybe 30 miles of the crow flies. And they say to me, How is this possible? Well, several things. One, the RF noise at the site is very low. So the noise floor is at around, you know, minus 110 to begin with. And two, the antenna is not looking up into the sky and looking out too far and hearing everything else. And plus the receiver and bandpass filtering and everything else we did on the duplexer. It helps to make the, you know, the, all these elements come together. But all of that adds up to understanding the principles behind, and you know, propagation and RF, where I can walk around on a portable, be 10 miles, 15 miles away, based on an antenna that's 275 feet above the ground. So I, that's what I like about playing with the RF and doing these things and defying it because it's just fun and it gets you thinking. And I, I don't know if you've had similar experiences, but that's that's the kind of stuff I like doing with, the, with my amateur license and, and, and knowledge and, and, and you know, moving around. Well, I, we, have a, we have a repeater on, on our tower here, uh, a ham repeater. that it's, it's a Crown Castle tower, but they've got permission for it to be up there. It was up there before Crown Castle on the tower. And it's a, it's a ham repeater. And uh, it's, uh, we've got a six meter, a two meter, and a 440 repeater on the tower, all triplex together on the one one feed line and then split apart up at the top with three different antennas. And uh, it's up about 700 feet on the on 1100 foot tower. And it does a good job. And especially uh, it's come in handy during flooding, during hurricanes. When we have hurricanes, uh, we, the, the hams in Florida, you know, we're, we're uh, in, well, not just Florida, but the whole Gulf coast um, and, and the Atlantic seaboard for that matter. Uh, are, you know, are really involved with uh, emergency communications with the counties, with the uh, with the uh, Red Cross. We furnish all of the Red Cross uh, uh, shelter communications, uh, all those type of things. And so uh, we 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 do we do those things, uh, and and that repeater handles that traffic. 
and uh, that's an important part of what ham radio is. And uh, the neat thing about ham radio, and, and I'm sure you'll understand this better than anybody, is that it's simple and um, it's easy and it's it's transportable and uh, it's very reliable. So uh, uh, that's that's one of the things that keeps uh, uh, keeps us involved in the emergency part of the thing, emergency communications part of things, because uh, it, it's a very very when you've got when you've got a good repeater system, uh, you can go to the to a school or to to some other public building where there's a shelter for for an a, a emergency event, and uh, you can set up in a with a very minimal antenna and uh, minimal power requirements and uh, be able to, uh, to, to, to furnish communications uh, to uh, whatever agency needs it. Well, that's absolutely true, and I have to say I've done that on many occasions, helped out in emergency communication setups. I've done more of the helping and designing and then actually participating at times. I wind up being the person they call in and I sit at the transmitter site and wait for, make sure everything keeps working, which is not a bad thing, actually, during emergencies and helping out the community. So it's it's a handy thing to have. And I'm just trying to see if I have, I don't think I have it handy, but I was trying to see if I have a repeater I can hit here in, in the office. Well, that one won't work. But yes, uh, a good system, you can't go wrong. And again, it's all based in the principles of understanding the RF and all the other wonderful elements that go into it. It's not just an antenna. It's not just a PA, the, the power amplifier. It's you know the duplexer, the filtering, the receiver noise, uh, you know, uh, the noise at the site itself. You know, at, at your site, 700 feet up, you may be very fortunate and have a nice quiet site on, the, on coming down the line. The site that I was just talking about earlier we were very lucky. The last time I checked, which was about two months ago, the noise floor, I think, came in at around uh, about 108 minus 108 dBm, which is pretty good because there's two cell sites there, two cellular companies, uh, and, and a couple of other land mobile folks. So it can be a little noisy at times. But before what, I go any the, further, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go, go ahead, Charlie. Oh, well, I, I was going to piggyback on noise floor. I, I, uh, this is more broadcast related, but it, it piqued my interest, uh, for my ham interest. Uh, uh, I was uh, assisting one of our other iHeart stations close by with a with a uh, an, I, a, uh, uh, an RF interference problem uh, regarding uh, noise floor and uh, regarding LTE and uh, 4G and uh, in this particular case it was C band uh, uh, C band uh, 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 to satellite reception where you had a, an FM station located at a studio site of a uh, television station who was putting in a new C-band dish and uh, they had the uh, people come in to do a, a sweep of the area and uh, found that the that the noise floor was not acceptable uh, to their to their to their standards and so we had to do a bunch of things to the building and to the air conditioning ducts and to all kinds of things to get uh, to to get the uh, the uh, noise floor down and that was a uh, an interesting thing to do, but it was also, uh, it, it was kind of my, my ham radio background, I think came in, came into play on, uh, on coming up with the resolution of that. But that, that's what I wanted to say there, Chris, go ahead. No, oh, I agree totally. Cause I did get called in on a, on a project two years ago on passive intermod at a site and it was interfering with uh, Coast Guard channels and other government agencies. And a friend of mine, the engineering firm that was hired, called me up and said, look, I, I, I'm befuddled. I, I don't understand this. I'm doing all the, the math and it just doesn't add up. Can you come out to the site? We've got a company coming out with a uh, intermod meter, monitor, spectrum analyzer. At, uh, I think it's the folks at Nauter came out with it. And can you just like be a third set of eyes? <laughs> and sure enough, we were going through some steps and I started asking questions about the site, the antennas, the installation, noticing a few things on the top of this building, the rooftop. And one of the guys uh, said, well, yeah, we recently made some changes here, here, and here. I'm like, really? So we started looking at the changes they made. It turns out that the changes they made were enough to create intermodulation through the rusty connections on the pipes, the the, the U-bolts, a uh, uh, the few things they did. They just reused some of the stuff. And we were actually able to pinpoint the passive intermod, the PIM, to this new installation they did with the old gear. And my buddy was like, how did you even think of this? I was like, well, believe it or not, there was a site I worked at years ago, an amateur radio site, where we ran into the same problem with a local, uh, lo local mobile radio vendor. They had some issues and interfered with us. And we're like trying to figure out where is this, this you know, offending signal coming from a carrier? And it turned out to be into mod because of, as we all hear, rusty connections that, that, uh, that can rectify and become a, a, another 
uh, what do you call it, radiating component uh, or emitter. And all of a sudden, you're like, wow, I got a third signal from nowhere. So it's fun being able to do this and, and enjoy these things. And it's just it just happens. It's nice. So um, before I go any further, though, I have to say we have uh, three sponsors for our, our, our episode today. And uh, we're going to go into <laughs> – we have uh, – the nice thing about what we're talking about with Dayton and, and the amateur hobby, amateur radio hobby, is that, and the newest technologies are based in IP and, the, and they're given simplicity. And as Charlie just mentioned, the, you know, emergency communications and amateur operators, you know, whether it's Aries, Racies, or any other uh, communications group that you work with in the amateur uh, field – and helping communities with communications during emergencies, if not during emergencies, say during you know, a marathon running or community walks and, and stuff that the community does, and they need help organizing because they're all volunteers. The new IP technologies in our amateur radio field help to make things easier to do or think of ways to do stuff we couldn't before because the technology didn't allow it in an easy way or workflow. Well, the folks at LAVO, all right, the, the uh, manufacturers of consoles, have a product called the LAVO Crystal Clear. And it's a IP-based system. It, it's everywhere you go. You find touchscreens that you know we use every day on a smartphone, maybe in your studios, maybe, oh, yeah, in your new car that has a touchscreen now. So the folks at Lavo have, have decided to take that approach and go, you know what? What can we do in the broadcast environment that would make it easier for people to do what they like to do? You know, when you're in a supermarket, the checkouts now, the point of sales have touchscreens. And, and, and why not? Touchscreens make sense because they're simple and natural. As Charlie mentioned earlier, simplicity is what makes things reliable, repeatable, and successful. So Lavo has taken the same approach. Their intuitive controls help you finish tasks faster, maybe with less errors. Isn't it time you brought the power of touch to your radio studio? Touchscreens are not a bad thing. I've built many studios and maintained many studios with touchscreens. I've learned a lot over the years as to which ones to buy and how to use them and what not to do. But the folks at Lava with the Crystal Clear product have got it down to a science. And you can, with the Crystal Clear virtual radio console from Lavo, Crystal Clear gives talent an instantly understandable multi-touch surface. Oh, I didn't mention that. Lavo Crystal Clear is a multi-touch surface, just like your smartphone where you can have multiple fingers doing things at once. I'm not talking one slider at a time. You can have all five fingers or if you want, maybe four is easier, to slide faders on your Lavo Crystal Clear surface. Keep that in mind. Think about it. It's a very interesting way to do stuff now. Much easier for some. And with the younger audience or younger, I shouldn't say audience, younger employees coming to the business, they're more familiar with touch screens and how to use touch items. And this would be a natural progression. Building a new facility, Lavo Crystal Clear, and the IP infrastructure you can build on that, makes total sense. Faders, meters, clocks, timers, talk back and more live in harmony on a single screen. And shows will run smoother because you can see everything where you need it and the touch surface makes it much easier to work with because you're more familiar with it. Crystal Clear's features, Lavo's exclusive auto mix, the hands-free smart mixing algorithm, which is designed for fast-paced multi-mic talk shows. And we know talk shows, whether it be sports or news or public affairs, however you want to call it, can be very hectic. So the auto gain, just push a button and the preamp calibrates automatically while your guest speaks into the microphone. How many times have you had guests that just decide to lean back then lean forward right into the microphone, and you're scrambling to find a way to, what? Oh, yeah, adjust the gain. With Lavo Crystal Clear, the auto gain function takes care of it for you. It calibrates and moves right along with your crazy talk show host, or maybe their crazy guest, because they're enthusiastic about the topic. That's all I'm saying. That's why I'm saying it's crazy. But it's good stuff. I've worked on many talk shows, and trust me, I've watched too many folks lean back, lean forward. But Lavo Crystal Clear will calibrate using the auto gain feature. Think about it. Again, I'm all about workflow, and you, know, you have to take a step back when you say touchscreen in a studio, multi-touch is big surface. What, are you crazy? No, no, no. Think about the workflow. Think about the application, and all of a sudden, you start to realize you can do more. And if you're a talk format or spoken word, you can do even more because of the IP infrastructure and the touchscreen capability. And they have other products that use touchscreen and IP, but we'll talk about the crystal clear product for now. So the talent can, you know, do anything they want, mixing controls, use the screen to do other things, and like working with delivery systems, audio editors, or phones. So the touch screen, the environment, all of a sudden now becomes a very fluid approach. So that it's more familiar. And I'm not saying that you can't use the old-fashioned stuff, but think about it. If you're moving into the new world of, of broadcasting, we have to be quicker about what we do and smarter. 
time to think about the touch screen, the, the touch, the surface. So the crystal clear power plant measures just one RU. That's right. Your real estate in the TOC might be getting a little cramped with all the servers for everything else. So a one RU is a pretty amazing when you consider the staggering amount of DSP power that's on board. And I've, at NAB, this past NAB, I looked inside and I'll tell you, they've crammed a lot in that one RU space and still make it very, very functional and you know, bulletproof or carrier class, we'll say. And it's really nice. You, know, you have compression, EQ, voice processing, and precision delay can all be applied to your microphone, line inputs, and digital sources. Optional upgrades include redundant power. Matty, for those of you who remember Matty, and if you had an old Pro Bell switcher, you'd remember that was a Matty switcher used in audio plants. Or you maybe want to do Ravenna as an IP protocol for interconnecting all your devices. And if you choose, it also supports AES67, so you can interoperate between the other protocols. Just as we spoke earlier with the IP and amateur radio and how they're all trying to find ways to interoperate, the Crystal Clear from Lavo has the ability to do all that with Ravenna, AES67, and all this power costs no more than you'd spend on an ordinary console, but with maybe 10 times the feature sets or workflow capabilities. Think about it. I've said this in the past, and, and I'll say it again. If you don't look at your facility from the workflow, or, or as the old saying goes, walk a mile in someone's shoes, you will not be building the proper facility and you will pay with the complaints and, and the arguments or the retrofitted mic booms in the TV monitor or the LCD screen that now sits somewhere that you originally didn't even think anything should go on the countertop in that studio or the control room. I've been there, done it, learned my lessons, and it's all about the workflow. So if you're looking to rebuild and you're thinking it's time to evolve or you know future-proof yourself, Lavo's Crystal Clear is a solution that you should consider. Look at the workflow. Call the folks at Lavo. Matter of fact, here in the States, the best way to go about it is Bill Bennett. He's at Lavo USA, and you can find out more by talking to him at 188-810-4468. Bill Bennett's a good guy. Met him at NAB. We've talked a couple of times and had some great stories and gets it, understands, and listens really good. So he's a real, I should say, listens very well. And, and, and that's what it's about. Listening to your, your jocks, your presenters, your talk show hosts, and then talking to the manufacturer, in this case, Bill Bennett, and say, Bill, here's what I've got. I'm thinking this, thinking that. And he will look at you or listen to you and say, well, consider this, consider that. Here's an option we have that you might want to add to this package. So these are things to think about. It's all about new console. Don't decide before you check out Crystal Clear from Lavo. Go to lavo.com, www.lavo.com. Lavo is L A W O. Com. And read about it. Or call Bill Bennett, please. If you call Bill Bennett, let's have some fun. Tell him you heard it on Twerd. I can't give you a discount. But it'll get a good laugh. And you know what? He'll probably treat you even better because we've met, we've talked, he knows what we're all about. Bill Bennett at Lavo, 1-888-810-4468 to find out more. The future is clear. Lavo crystal clear. And just tell him Twerd sent you. All right, that's what we have for Crystal Clear and the IP and the wonderful stuff that goes on. Now, I was um, thinking with, um, with the amateur background, how much do you think the IP stuff that, you know, the um, NXDN, Moto Turbo, was it the PDMR in Europe, uh, even the um, Fusion, how much of that will help somebody like you and I and others of our, of our ilk who are amateurs and, and professional broadcasters do you think there's there's a lot of commonality if you know building a site that's you know a central a central station server for you know Moto Turbo and others and the IP and, and learning all the various things does it help? Do you think there's, there's something to it that we, at least we can cross over in both realms? Oh, I I think so. And and one of the things uh, and this may be kind of far fetched, but it, it it hits home to me is that this this new IP based uh, technology for ham radio. Uh, gives me something else uh, new to to learn about as far as its use in ham radio, and that fall, you were talking about the uh, the uh, interoperability of different uh, protocols. Uh, one of the things, uh, one of those products I was talking about before, the the, the DV4 uh, group of thing, of uh, of uh, the DV4 systems from uh, Wireless Holdings. Those boxes actually, what they do, you can take an analog in and come out with D, uh, D Star or APCO 25 or DMR or Fusion. What they do is they have uh, 
uh, the, these uh, these this the the mobile unit that they have actually has three SDR receivers in it and two transmitters, and um, they they can bring the say a a D star in on two meters. They break it down into a uh, a regular uh, piece a PCM audio. They, they demodulate it to PCM audio. Then they can take that. And they can send it back out as DMR or as APCO 25 or as even uh, Yezu's fusion system. So it's really, uh, they're, they're going a step further than a lot of people go in on the broadcast side of it in making uh, these radios where they can uh, talk different languages, so to speak, uh, out of one box. And, uh, and uh, I, I wanted to bring that up. I didn't think I, I, when I was going over the, the, the new products, I, I mentioned that. But, but I think the new IP uh, radio technology in ham radio gives me something else uh, uh, to, to look at and uh, something new to look at where, you know, like, like I said at the beginning, my, my big thing is contesting and DXing. I, I could care less about getting on and rag chewing every night on 75 meters about uh, how, how good I feel or whatever, I, 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 or how bad I feel or, or whose birthday it is or whatever. But, but uh, I, I, I do enjoy contesting and DXing, and I am getting a pretty good interest into the uh, to, to, to D-Star. And so I, I'm, I'm going to be buying a, a couple of these little boxes, especially the uh, – the DV4 dongle, the dongle I could buy. I've got a couple of Raspberry Pis, and I, I was going to take one and dedicate it to ham radio uh, by, by using one of these dongles on uh, the DV, what they call the DV4 Mini. And you can actually take that, and like I said, you can go from D Star to analog, analog to, to fusion, fusion to D Star, APCO 25 to DMR. It doesn't matter because uh, all those uh, all those radios. The, the thing that makes this work is the SDR, the software defined re receiver or software defined radio, and and that's that's what's uh, making the flexibility uh, available to uh, to to the ham community as far as uh, interoperability of systems. And you know, there's there's something to be said for that, and it's something that uh, maybe the commercial radio business ought to ought to look at so that they can uh, they can have uh, systems that would. Uh, Especially in an emergency situation where you have an interagency communications problem because of, of different types of transmission systems, this would be a way of uh, of uh, dealing with this. They could take a, take a uh, take a cue from the ham radio community and, and come up with some uh, some conversion radios that would convert from one to the other and retransmit it on another frequency at the at the so that the two could talk back and forth. Oh yeah, yeah. No, interoperability is definitely something that uh, is a tough one to, to cover with the technologies and, and what's the best method. Um, but okay, cool. So all right, so you're getting the same thought that I had as well with the IP and learning and understanding and playing around. And I agree, I'm not one for uh, rag chewing on repeaters and doing stuff. I, I'm more about the playing with the technology stuff and working in the background and the behind the scenes. So I I usually get the phone calls from friends going, "We have no idea how to do this. We think, but something went wrong and." It popped, and now nothing works, and I'm the one that gets the call, so it's it's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to sit and talk about anniversaries and whatnot. That's not, not I could do that somewhere else, <laughs> maybe at a barbecue. But uh, that's cool. Now at Dayton, um, I, I didn't make it this year. I, I try to go almost every year, but the last two years have been tough because of schedule conflicts. Uh, anything like crazy that you caught? Because I know when I used to go. Uh, I'd see some stuff that just was out of you know just out of left field. It usually wound up being some former uh, you know uh, DoD de device or product that you know was tested by somebody from L3 Communications and they tossed it out. Uh, anything like that? Any of the you know the wild esoteric stuff that sometimes we, we grab our hands on and modify and use? The, the the one thing I think, and you if you've been in the last have you been in the last three years? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, one one of the things did you see the big tower that the Japanese people make that Lu Lusco Luso yeah tower? yes yes that, they they were there with that thing again this year and it's you know it's just a huge tower and uh, I could see a broadcaster uh, having an application for something like that perhaps I don't know it it, yeah. it, it you know in some in some weird yeah. situation but it's a tower that uh, you have a, you actually it's a, it's a telescoping tower. Uh, but it's a very large tower. What would you say, Chris? Probably 30, 36 inches on a face at the base, probably. That's and, and, yeah. Uh, I think that's about right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and but it but it's it's a telescoping tower. I think it goes to one hundred and twenty feet. Self supporting, by the way. Um, yeah, that, that was and, the best uh, part of it. 
Oh, sorry. I lost your audio. Say that again. Oh, I'm sorry. The best part was the uh, it's 120 feet self-supporting. And you're like, wow, uh, this is pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. And, but you've got a uh, you you actually have a work platform about 20 feet off the ground where you can uh, where, where you can work all around all uh, 360 degrees around the tower. And there's actually a stairway that goes up to that point. So uh, I mean. You can you can bring the an, the antennas all the way down to a nesting position and and you can walk up this stairway and you've got a big huge work platform that you can work work from uh, on the tower. It, I think the thing runs around tax tag and title installed about a hundred and I want to say about one hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars, but I mean uh, and they actually are selling them here in the states. I mean. I mean, not just one or two. Uh, from what I understand, they've sold uh, upwards of twenty or thirty of these towers around the around the U.S. Well, I would have to imagine the wireless industry is probably picking those up. Maybe not. Well, you would think that that would be a good uh, somehow. If they could come up with a you know, a cat, it'd be a great great tower for a cow for a, a for a portable yep. a portable cell site. Yeah, I, I've seen some. I've seen some interesting looking cows lately. Uh, the cell, cellular on wheels. For those of you who've never heard the term before, uh, <laughs> I'm not talking cow tipping, but uh, yeah, some of those mobile <laughs> cell sites. Uh, those mobile cell sites lately have been really uh, wild. I, I was at the Stevens Institute last fall for a, uh, a session on disaster recovery or business continuity, and, and uh, there were folks from AT and T there and CNN. It was, it was a combination for broadcast as well as uh, the telecommunications industry representative. So I was there representing uh, local radio stuff. CNN was there for television. And then the AT&T folks were there for their disaster recovery or uh, business continuity. And some of the, th the pictures and some of the discussions, they, they, what they can do and how they can deploy, as you mentioned earlier with emergency communications and the ability to be able to be up and running and on in a situation where you, know, you have no certainty of what's going on around you. It was just fascinating. Some of the technologies that are employed and the tower structures they can put up in no time or in the back of a trailer or, or transport it on a flatbed or in a trailer or a, on a cab. It was pretty wild. And at Dayton, when I see this, this kind of stuff, you think, oh, wow, there's actually somebody using this and it's actually, you know, makes sense. It's pretty wild. It's, it's fun stuff. It's a hobby that I think people sometimes don't realize you can do a lot with, as you pointed out, with what, you've, what you enjoy about it. And yeah, it can be expensive, but what hobbies aren't? I mean, I'm an amateur photographer, and I tell you, it's no, no cheaper at times. <laughs> yeah, you could buy one camera and a good a good lens, and and have a hell of a ham radio station with it. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. The glass alone is enough for a ham station. Then the body of the camera comes in and has the utility is like a power strip at times. It's about it. But yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's pretty wild, I have to say. But um, hey, people in 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 your market, um, a lot of the broadcasters part of any local uh, you know amateur groups, and you guys get together or talk, or maybe people on staff. I'm just curious, you know, what what you have. We we really don't have that many broadcast engineers here in this market that are hams. Uh, there are one or two, uh, but, um, and most of them are not even active. Uh, I'm about the only active ham that's a broadcaster in the, in the market at the present time. Uh, but, uh, we have an active radio club here. I, I don't go to it that often because most of the guys in the local radio club are the ones that with the, uh, you know, they call it the shack on the belt, the, you know, the belt. The belt, it's got the, the handheld radio on it, and that's their ham shack, and they don't have anything at home. All they have is that little walkie-talkie, and that's all they do, and and that's all they want to talk about, and I don't really care to do that. But I do join them for uh, for field day every year, and we have a big time at field day, which is coming up uh, uh, next month in about the last, I think it's the last weekend in June, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if you've ever had, uh, messed with field day or not, but it's always a big a big uh, amateur radio, ham radio uh um, event every year and it happens every year yes I, I've helped over the years with friends I haven't participated 100% but I've, I've definitely attended I'm familiar with it and that is a lot of fun you're absolutely right I, I have met many folks who enjoy it and look forward to it that's a good time good time by all without a doubt now in the broadcast side of things where you are how much IP stuff does your staff get involved in like I Kirk and I always kid about this and I always say you know I call my my IT uh, infrastructure for the studios, 
my broadcast revenue IT, the Brits. <laughs> it's my broadcast revenue IT structure. And then there's the business office land. How do you guys handle that at your place? I'm just, or in your, in your um, sphere of things. Well, I'm reaching, I'm reaching over here to get something because it's funny you should mention that. I am, uh, let me see if I can get this. This is a little device. Uh, this is an IP controlled relay. And I'm going to be installing it tomorrow uh, up in the business end of the building. Uh, we, we've, we've done some change. We put in a new a card access system to the building and into our, uh, into our reception area. We now, have a, we now have an iPad for a receptionist, okay? That's all I'm going to say about that. We have an iPad for a receptionist. You go up and you touch the iPad and, and you tell the iPad what you want, who you want to talk to. And that iPad uh, sends them a text message and uh, an email at the same time to let them know that so-and-so's at the front door to pick up a prize or to see a salesperson or whatever. Well, we, we've, we've wanted, we had to do for security purposes, we had to put on a, in a card access system. We had a card access system, but we had to add some items to uh, some additional uh, uh, items to the doors in the reception area to, to limit access past the rece reception area. So, um, uh, this little relay here I'm putting in, uh, there it is again with the Ethernet Ethernet jack on it. And let me see. Wait, I'm not there. There you go. There we go. <laughs> it's hard to do looking at it. But uh, it, these are neat little boxes. But uh, I mean, even, I mean, IP has gotten right into the, into everything. I mean, it's not your audio servers and your traffic machines and your, your uh, consoles and your, audio blades and all of the other things you have, it's now getting into the, uh, to relays that you want to, you want to trigger so that a door will open without somebody having to get out of their debt off out of their office to go open the door for a visitor to come in. So that's what this is all about. So, I mean, IP is everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And, uh, of course our, 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 our telephone system we put in, uh, a couple of years ago is, is VOIP and, uh, they they have uh, they uh, iHeart has combined the Panama City and the Tallahassee markets into one market into one business unit, and uh, we both have IP phone systems. Well, uh, the general manager here in Panama City is also the general manager in uh, Tallahassee, and so uh, Randy Moore, the engineer over in Tallahassee, sent me one of their phones over here. I plugged it in, and and uh, now the people in Tallahassee when they need to to reach uh, the general manager. They don't have to dial long distance or dial our cell phone number. They can just dial our extension number, and it'll pick pick up here in Panama City. And uh, you know that that's old hat for a lot of people who've had IP phones for a while. But uh, for us in the Florida Panhandle, it's pretty damn funny. I mean, it's it's amazing. It, it, how do you do that? You know, they they thought that was amazing that we could do that because uh, <laughs> uh, it's IP technology. It's it's everywhere. I mean, that's why I picked up that re relay. There it was just to show you right to the you know. I, I don't have to run wire and put a push button in anymore. I just put a little uh, shortcut on the desktop, and when you open that, when you open that on the desktop, there's a little thing, and you hit the, you click on it, and it opens the door. And uh, it's IP can be very can be very uh, kind to you. Can it save you a lot of work? Yeah, this is true, and it, that goes back to what I was saying with the the workflow. And uh, it's pretty it's pretty handy. Matter of fact, I put together I use a similar. IP relay type device, different brand, uh, for a, a SCOM controller at a repeat site, repeater site, because of uh, electrical disturbances and stuff. That was for whatever reason. Once in a while, the controller would just uh, go bat crazy and either begin transmitting and just stay in transmit mode or just not respond. So uh, I put in an IP relay, and boy, what what a, what a saving moment that was when I could get a call and say, "Hey, I think the repeater's in trouble. Hang on." Deet, 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 deet. How about now? Hey, it's working. Yeah, great. I can go back to having <laughs> having my dinner. <laughs> you know, 20 years ago, we've been in the car, driving up to the site and see what we can do, power and cycle the box. So I have to say, yeah, uh, uh, yeah you, you've definitely that. been down that road. Yeah, I run into that. I've got a couple of net booters for my transmitter, a couple of, a couple of my transmitter sites where I have IP connectivity. And uh, sometimes uh, we'll have a little short electrical uh, blip not, I mean, really short, short enough that the UPS doesn't even kick in, but it's, it does, you know, you know how you get these uh, transmitter sites with, with lightning and whatnot, you get, uh, especially in Florida, you get these anomalies, we'll call them, uh, in, in the power, in the power uh, distribution system. And uh, 
all of a sudden your remote control doesn't want to respond or, uh, or maybe an Optimod has, uh, or, or audio processor has, uh, change the way it sounds on the air. So all I've got to do is go in there with these, these little net booters. I bring it up and click and reboot, and then we're back to back to normal. And uh, those, yep. those are nice. That saves you that 30 miles. All my transmitter sites are 30 miles away. I've got transmitter sites 30 miles to the southeast and 30 miles to the northeast. So I mean, northwest. So, I mean, it's actually almost set a 70-mile drive for me to go from my my WPAP, WFSY transmitter site north of town to the WFLF transmitter site, which is southeast of here, 30 miles. So it's, it's, I've got a lot of area and, and that saves me a lot of time when it comes to having to, uh, to, uh, you know, get something uh, rebooted. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, trust me. I've had those situations where my sites were too far away. I'm like, oh, I don't, I've got to do this drive at uh, two o'clock in the morning. But now with the IP, I've been pretty good at getting the right things in the right place and being able to remotely reset, which has been very handy. Well, we're coming close to the end of our, uh, our show, and I, um, I have to do our last sponsor. Uh, it's about Telephone Hybrids. But before I do, Charlie, what we always do at the show with our guests uh, is ask for a tip. So a tip of the week, tip of the day, whatever you want to call it. Something that you can espouse on folks about something you discover, whether it be an AES decoder that you carry around or, or you know, bit sampler, whatever you want to call it, or anything else. Maybe a simple tester that you found works really well in a, in a LAN environment that just makes it easier to troubleshoot your AOIP network. Uh, you know, something like that. So while I'm doing the spot, or the, the sponsorship, if you would, think of something, and then when we come back together to close out, we'll ask you about it. How's that? Okay. Excellent. Well, this, uh, our sponsor for the, uh, the close of the show is Telos HX1 and the HX2. Uh, HX1 is a one-line POTS uh, telephone hybrid. HX2 is a two-line POTS telephone hybrid. Uh, the most advanced hybrids ever developed for use with analog phones. Now, remember, you see this, you hear me say this, you're like, oh, yeah, the most advanced. Let's not forget Steve Church did hybrids way back in the day before they became popular and came up with ways to make them sound really good, very consistent and repeatable. So let's think about the history and the legacy of the Telos hybrid. So now we move forward to digital technologies and more advancement and many years of experience. Telos's HX1, HX2, two-line POTS codec hybrids are the most advanced and they do the job. And I've used them and I can say they do the job very well. HX hybrids contain, adv contain advanced third-generation Telos hybrid superior audio quality. As I said before, they've been doing it for a while, they've learned a few things, and now they apply the technology. If you don't believe me, just call over to the Telos Alliance, ask for Frank Foti, and he'll tell you. Then again, you may not want to do it in person, do it by phone, it's safer. I'm only saying. But anyway... The Telos hybrids are, have superior audio quality, universal POTS interface features, disconnect signal detection, which works with telco providers worldwide. It's a standard stuff, but it's done in a very simple, nice package. HX hybrids include unique features to make operators' lives easier, such as the auto answer with select selectable ring count. Not every hybrid did that back in the day, and it comes in handy. A switchable mic line input, call screening and line hold features, and front panel send and receive audio metering. You say, why? Well, sometimes you're doing a talk show, and all of a sudden the caller says, I don't hear anything. You can look down and quickly say, well, I'm feeding audio to the hybrid. I see it going in. The problem should be at their end. So you, could, you now can at least honestly say, hey, check your phone again. Or check your connection. So these are things that you overlook day to day, but the features on the HX1, HX2 make it much easier for you to get the job done and done right and sounding great. Audio sweetening tools include Telos's digital dynamic EQ. DDEQ. Not sure. I mean, if you like acronyms, DDEQ. Remember that. An adjustable smart leveler, symmetrical wide range AGC, and of course, with telephone hybrids, noise gate by the Omnia folks. Okay? Omnia noise gating takes place in your hybrid. You know you're in great shape. Studio adaption and pitch shifting for use in open speaker applications. And adjustable caller override. Just to name a few things that you will benefit from. Telos HX1 and HX2. Be sure to contact your dealer and talk to them about it. The pricing is very competitive, but the feature sets go beyond that. Enjoy it. It'll make sense. And by the way, if you're using hybrids, and sometimes people forget, hybrids are very handy. Maybe you have an IFB you need to be able to have available. People like IFB. Studio monitoring, off-air signal, cues from the studio. You're in the field. You're doing some remote broadcast, off-site, you know, outside broadcast. Hybrid connection. 
you, is the best way to get IFB because it connects, it connects, you know it's there, and it's you. You're dedicated. You don't have to worry about sharing with anyone else. And don't worry if you have an IP PBX, there are ATA adapters that allow you to convert and connect to the hybrids. So you can still do IP voice or voice over IP, connect to the hybrids and make it happen. So these are things to consider for IFBs, listen lines. Listen lines are handy. A lot of people think they've gone away. They haven't. And don't don't use the listen line concept of, well, we can stream it. You know, we'll use a box and stream it to an IP address and give it to our consultant. Yeah, that's nice. But nine times out of ten, you're better off with a hybrid listen line. And the best way to make it sound right and consistent and can easily accessible, Telos, HX1, or HX2. So give those a try and just contact your local dealer or go to the Telos Alliance website and click on the hybrids. The nice 1RU boxes, information on the front panel makes it easy. And this is the way to do it. So, remember, Telos, HX1, HX2, POTS Telephone Hybrids. It's the way to go. All right, Charlie, we have come to the close, the end of the show. I'm running probably about a minute behind, but we'll, we'll go through it. What's your tip? What do, you, what do you want to give our audience and say, hey, folks, if you never thought of it, I've got an answer for you? Well, I've got a real quick one. A lot of eyes are going to roll when I, when I say this because it's uh, something very basic. But we've been talking about IP the last couple of minutes, and um, – I run into situations where uh, I've uh, I've got 110 blocks all over the building here where I've got Cat5 Cat5 cable uh, and whatnot. And one thing about Cat5 cable is uh, sometimes if you're trying to tone, you know, trying to find a particular pair uh, of or a group of, of wires in a in a Cat5 group uh, because of the twisting and whatnot. Uh, your normal fox and hound will not work. Well, I've got I've got a I, I bought a system. Uh, that I like, and it, it, it seems to be a little bit more robust when you're trying to trace out uh, and, and confirm a, a good a good end-to-end uh, Cat5 uh, circuit, and that is uh, this right here. It's made by Fluke Networks. It's called a Microscanner Pro, and uh, it's not only a, not only checks the integrity of the of the of the uh, of the of the pairs of all, all four pairs in a, in a Cat5 cable, but it also uh, uh, will uh, will generate a, a some kind of a tone that the companion uh, hound will f- will find easily uh, and and I've tried other fox and hounds and I've not been able to hear the tone but when I use uh, this particular system I can hear the tone great so uh, if you've been looking for something like that that's something to look at they're not expensive at all and it comes with a little this little thing here that goes on the other end of the cable. Uh, so that you can confirm the integrity of the cable and uh, and and make sure that your network is uh, running at optimum speed. But uh, that's that's really all I got, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, I hope that wasn't too uh, uh, retro there for everybody. Oh no, I, I I'm quite aware of the product, and um, I've used several other products from Fluke on that level. So no, you're you're right in the ballpark. It's perfect, and it does work. You're absolutely right. It, the, the old analog tone test of the Fox and Hound unfortunately cannot be used in some of the new digital environments we're now exposed to. So you've got it right. Well, we have come to the close of our show, the end of a great hour of time, and those of you in the audience who are amateur operators, I know Pete Torriello is out there. He watches and listens all the time. And Thank you very much for being patient, understanding where we're tr- going with Dayton and the object or the, uh, the idea of amateur operators and what the, the, the hobby can do for you. And Charlie Wooten, who is always, when he's a guest on the show, gives us some of the best stories, some of the best ideas about things. And you sit back and go, whoa, why didn't I think of that? Charlie has already or has experienced it and is pa- sharing it with all of us. So this week in Radio Tech, I'm Chris Tobin with Charlie Wooten. This is episode 306, and we will see you again on the netcast this week in radio tech next time